I'm ready. So now we're going to actually talk a little bit more about some of these things so you can see them a bit closer about what's at the head of the bed, what you might see at the patient when you're actually looking at the patient's face, and some of the things that you can see a little bit more clearly in this particular picture. So as you saw before, the monitor is there. You can see it a little bit better now. And you will see at the top is almost always uh, the heart rate. Uh, you would almost always see blood pressure next. You might see what's called an arterial line next and oximetry at the bottom. And they're usually set up that way so that they're standard. So make sure that when you're looking at it, you're looking at all of the elements and that you always check that before you actually touch the patient because you want to know what those numbers are and you want to be sure that those are, uh, you know what it was before you started and what it is either during your treatment or afterwards. Um, <clears throat> when you're looking at the head of the bed, you will see this particular um, element, which is uh, set up for suction. This is actually to suction the lungs and take um, sputum, etc., out of the lungs when someone cannot cough. So that may be using an endotracheal tube. Sometimes we have to do it nasally, not much fun. Um, and it also will, it can be set up to suction oral secretions as well. So that is what that is exclusively used for. The other elements that you see, you will see um, other suction um, uh, requirements. It may be from a pleurovac or some other um, types of interventions. You will see medical air, which is used in some situations where you're trying to um, do a particular intervention and then you will see oxygen. With the oxygen you actually need to make sure that when you check it that it is connected to the patient so there will always be a connection here on the bottom on the nipple and that you check to make sure that the the ball there's going to be a little silver ball in here and that it is sitting in the center of the number of liters per minute that the patient is supposed to be on. Generally, when someone's in ICU, they're often on a very high amount of oxygen, but it can be reduced over time. And when they're on a ventilator, it may be being delivered by the ventilator. But if it is attached here, you have to be sure that that's the right amount and that it hasn't, particularly if you're moving patients around, or you may have switched them over to um, an oxygen tank, when they go back on the wall oxygen, you have to make sure that that's correct. Um, you will see other types of, again, other types of suction. This is another one that might be connected to the pleurovac. Um, a little closer view of what a pleurovac looks like. This will always be sitting below the patient's chest wall or the, where the tube is. It will never be above that. It, and I put it up here on the bed for you to see it a little bit more closely, but it must always stay below where the actual tube goes into the patient. Um, and it will be bubbling if there's air coming out or if you see fluid coming. Um, the, the other types of things that uh, I want to identify is just as you're looking at someone who is intubated, they could be intubated a couple of different ways. So this particular patient has an endotracheal tube in, which is the most common thing. And this, once it, the patient improves, it will be removed from the patient for them to start to breathe on their own. The other way that you might see is with a trachea, which would be right at the center of the um, midline of the, at the, the base of the throat in the uh, notch. And the reason that someone might have a trachea versus an endotracheal tube is because they may have been on an endotracheal tube for a long time and they cannot continue to keep the person that way without causing problems to the vocal cords. Or it may be that they are going to be a long-term uh, patient on ventilation or a long-term patient needing to assistance to clear their lungs. And they are therefore they'll make a decision to put a trachea, uh, tracheostomy in instead. Those are difficult things for patients. Um, but they're often in the more chronic patients, that's what you will see. So this is the type of thing you're gonna see. The one thing that happens quite often in a uh, in intensive care unit is that because there are so many lines, people are hesitant to move patients a lot. Um, the nurses are concerned that, that something's going to come dislodged and there's concern that moving patients may disrupt um, a stable patient or a, a patient who's maybe marginally stable. 
If you are to be moving that patient, you need to work directly with the nurse. You need to make sure that you're clear about what their concerns are, and you need to address those concerns, and you need to give your rationale why you've been given the task of moving this patient. Um, and you need to be careful how you actually approach it in that it needs to be firm because this has to happen. Patients who don't move in ICU get pneumonias very quickly and they become really uh, difficult to actually move and rehabilitate. The, so you need to be able to work with the nurses to say how is the best thing for you, what do you, when's the best time, and you need to actually make sure that you are being very um, team friendly as you go forward with this type of work because it is a, it's a challenging place to work and um, the nurses are with that patient full time and they do know them well, but they're, they're, they know that they have to move patients. If there's a change in that patient's condition, you make sure you go back to your therapist to discuss it and um, give an idea where you might need some support going back into ICU to have that conversation about moving the patient again. So I hope this helps. Let me know if there's anything, any other questions, you know where to find me.